I call to this hearing of the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Food, Nutrition, Specialty Crops, Organics, and Research to order. Chairwoman Stevenow. And Ranking Member Boozman, thank you so much for coming. I thank you for your leadership on this committee, and I look forward to working with you to pass a farm bill. A farm bill that works for small far farmers, rural communities, and hungry Americans. I would also like to thank my ranking member, Senator Braun. And I look forward to working closely with you. SNAP is one of the most effective programs to fight hunger and poverty in the country. In my time in, effort, in IFAS, as the mayor of Braddock to lieutenant governor to now, I have heard from Pennsylvanians about their support for SNAP. Hunger is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. It's all of our issue that we have to take it on. We need to come together and stop playing political games with Americans' access to food. Americans like Chair, about Clory Jor from the, north, the town of Northeast in Pennsylvania tells me that his victim was skimming, which was when somebody stole money and he relied from its SNAP EBT. Mr. Jor is not the first Pennsylvanian I've heard this from. I fear he won't be the last and I will work in this farm bill to modernize SNAP to work to recipients in the 21st century. I look forward to from hearing from you, your witness on this nutrition assistance on the farm bill. And I will now turn to Senator Braun for any opening comments that he would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, this is the second Congress that I'm serving as a ranking member on this subcommittee. I'm excited to return to the subcommittee, and I'm looking forward to working with Chairman Federer to find bipartisan solutions. We're meeting today as part of the committee's consideration of the 2023 Farm Bill. The bill will cost us more than it ever has in history, and I want to make sure that if we're spending more, we do it efficiently. Earlier this year, when Secretary Vilsack testified before the committee, I asked him as a former governor if he was concerned with runaway spending, and he, like many of us, would be. So I think whenever we entertain any of this, we got to make sure that we're getting value out of whatever we're proposing. I ran a logistics and distribution business for 37 years and did it sustainably. Uh, by keeping overhead low, being very aggressive and finding new ways of doing things, and was able to pay the bills and grow the company sustainably. I'd like to see some parallels here in terms of how we do things in our own federal government. As the committee drafts and considers the 2023 Farm Bill, I look forward to trying to incorporate these principles into it. In the coming weeks, I'll introduce bipartisan legislation, the SNAP Fresh Access Pilot Program Act to create a pilot program with a supplemental nutrition assistance program that allows participants to spend down a portion of their benefit to receive a food box with fruit, vegetables, meat, dairy, and eggs. As we learned at this subcommittee's hearing last year on food as medicine, the private sector has a vested interest in using wellness and nutrition to de decrease spending on remediation medically. So not only here, the private sector needs to pick up the slack and do that on their own account as well. This program checks each of these boxes by creating a new option within SNAP that allows recipients to exercise agency, and it also uh, is going to let uh, increases to healthy foods through SNAP. So I think it's got a two-pronged approach to it. Also plan to introduce legislation, the Hand Up Act, that will ensure SNAP is implemented in a way that measurably improves the employment outcomes of able-bodied Americans. Hand Up Act helps connect SNAP recipients with work by closing the loopholes that government has used to downplay the stability of employment by requiring states to focus on common sense outcome measures in their employment and training programs. 
Able-bodied adults without dependents uh, are required to work, uh, by law, to work, volunteer, or participate in a work program for at least 80 hours per month to keep their SNAP benefits. This work requirement has been in place since 96 and was passed with bipartisan support, including that of Senator Joe Biden. Today, 18 states, including California and New York, operate with full state waivers. And in fact, half of SNAP's ABA WDs live in waived areas, many of which actually have low unemployment and ample job listings. I think this is an opportunity to find more employment and help feed those better that need it. We'll hear from our witnesses today about how SNAP can be improved to actually help recipients escape poverty, and I'm really looking forward to what each one of you has to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And we will now move to introduce our witnesses. And I'm excited about the panel that we have us with us today. I'll introduce them all now. Mrs. Ty Jones Cox is the Vice President of the Food Assistance Policy at, at the Senate for Budget and Policy Priorities. Welcome. Ms. Heather Reynolds is the Managing Director of the Lab for Economic Opportunities at Notre Dame. Welcome. And Mrs. Lori Jones John and the CEO of Philabunts, the largest food food bank in Pennsylvania, and is also serves of Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Hey, okay. it's a great organization from a great state that I've heard of pretty well. <laughs> We certainly agree. <laughs> Ms. Mr. James Whitford of the Executive Directory of the Water Gardens in Joplin, Missouri. Sir, I like that look. <laughs> and then, and finally, Mrs. Heist, uh, Whitley Heisting of the Outreach Specialist, which the Hunger Fee America for Food Link in New York. And Mrs. Cox, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chair Stabano and Fetterman, Ranking Member Braun, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Ty Jones Cox, Vice President of Food Assistance Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a nonpartisan policy institute in Washington, D.C. I want to make three key points. SNAP plays a critical role in reducing hunger and poverty. SNAP supports and incentivizes work by helping low-wage workers make ends meet, and SNAP should be strengthened in the Farm Bill. SNAP is our nation's most effective tool for combating hunger and food insecurity, especially among children, older adults, people with disabilities, and veterans. SNAP reduces food insecurity as, by as much as 30%. SNAP also plays a critical role in reducing poverty. SNAP provides families with the money they need to purchase groceries, helping to free up their limited resources to spend more on other basic needs such as housing, utilities, and childcare. SNAP improves outcomes in education, economic security, and self-sufficiency for children later in life. When children are hungry, their performance at school suffers. But when children have access to SNAP benefits, they are more likely to complete school, attain higher education, and go on to secure better paying jobs. SNAP is also linked to better health. SNAP participants are more likely to report very good health than low-income non-participants, and children participating in SNAP face lower nutritional deficiencies and poor health, which improves their health outcomes throughout their lifetimes. SNAP reduces racial disparities. One chart that sticks with me really highlights huge disparities between the food insecurity rate of households headed by a black, Latino, American Indian, or Alaskan Native adult in comparison to average for the households headed by a white adult. The difference in some cases is as big as 15 to 20 percentage points. Boost to SNAP benefits in late 2021 reduce poverty for black and Latina people and help reduce racial disparities. So as we think about improving SNAP, our eye must remain on how we can reduce those disparities and not increase them by making harmful cuts. 
Finally, SNAP is an important support for workers. The majority of SNAP participants are children, older adults, and people with disabilities. But among SNAP participants who can work, the majority do so or will return in the future. But many of the jobs held by SNAP participants, such as service or sales positions, often pay low wages and don't offer regular work hours or benefits like paid sick leave. SNAP supplements low pay, help smooth out income fluctuations due to irregular hours. Take, for example, a mother of two teenagers who is working two jobs at minimum wage but doesn't make enough to afford rising prices of food and housing. SNAP helps keep both her and her family fed. For millions of workers, work does not itself guarantee steady or sufficient income to provide for their families. As a legal aid attorney in Virginia, I saw clients balance work, child care, and caregiving demands, and SNAP provided a critical link when their income was not enough to feed their families. SNAP is a program that incentivizes work by providing critical food assistance for low-wage workers while they are working and during periods of unemployment. Given these realities of low-wage work, any attempt to expand SNAP's existing harsh work reporting requirements rely on faulty assumptions. Research shows that taking SNAP benefits away from people doesn't help them find jobs or higher earnings. It just leaves them and their families with less money for food. No one can work when they are hungry. SNAP is an important but modest benefit at only $6 per person per day. And SNAP spending did increase during the pandemic, which it, when it greatly reduced hunger, but SNAP spending has begun to fall with the end of the emergency pandemic provisions. Families are already experiencing a cut as a result, which means less money for food at a time when food prices are high. SNAP is successful at reducing poverty and food insecurity and should be protected from cuts. Instead of making the program less effective by cutting it or creating more barriers for participants, we should make improvements so it does even more to combat hunger for everyone. For example, we must increase access. Some low-income food insecure people are excluded from the program entirely, including those subject to the three-month time limit, people with drug-related felony convictions, and people living in certain U.S. territories. In conclusion, in 2018, this committee showed you can find bipartisan agreement to protect and modestly strengthen SNAP with the Farm Bill that got 86 votes from senators. As this committee works to develop the 2023 Farm Bill, I urge you to work in that vein to shore up this program that has already proven to be so successful at reducing hunger among our most vulnerable and protected from cuts that would take food away from the people who need it most. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cox. Thank you, Chairman Fetterman, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the committee. I serve at the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, or LEO, at the University of Notre Dame, where we work with providers across the country to build rigorous evidence around programs designed to move people out of poverty. Prior to joining LEO, I spent two decades as CEO of Catholic Charities Fort Worth. I will never forget meeting Marcia, a single mom working a full-time job that just didn't cut it. She spent hours figuring out which bill to pay because when you make $1,200 a month, you spend a significant amount of your time making such choices. She came to us because the avalanche of poverty had just closed in around her. She had run out of food and it was living in a place with no running water in the bathroom. We worked with Marcia, helping her with food via SNAP and getting her into new housing. When Marcia moved into her new apartment, she taught her daughter a life lesson that I pray I never have to teach mine. She took her hand and she held it under the warm running water. She squeezed it tightly and told her little girl never to take anything for granted. I struggle to tell this story without feeling sad and if I'm honest, kind of angry. How much potential did our country lose from this woman because she spent so much time figuring out how to feed her family? How behind are her children in school because she couldn't spend time reading to them or they were hungry, which we know is not ideal for learning. Instead, this mom spent her energy trying to make sure her family survived in poverty. Today, I want to use my time to suggest two points that I believe would have made her situation better. First, as we think about the Farm Bill, we need to be less focused on work requirements and more focused on evidence-based reform that will give people a way out of poverty. 
75% of SNAP recipients who are not disabled or elderly already work. Our solution needs to be to give them solutions that work. That's why we at Notre Dame spend so much of our time working with providers across the country to understand what works for a path out of poverty. At LEO, we have over 90 research studies across the country, and our partners have solutions. Solutions in Texas. LEO completed a randomized control trial to understand the impact of the Padua program, a holistic case management program designed by Catholic Charities Fort Worth. Families get flexible financial assistance that case managers can use to incentivize clients. Clients were 25% more likely to be employed, 60% more likely to be stably housed, and experience a sharp decline in credit card debt. Solutions in New York. The Bridges to Success program is designed by Action for a Better Community to provide working poor residents of Rochester with economic mobility mentors. 73% of these participants utilize SNAP at the time of intake. They set explicit goals and work to achieve self-sufficiencies with financial incentives along the way. We have done a randomized controlled trial of this program and the results show people are more likely to be employed. And we have solutions in Indiana. The Goodwill Excel Center of Central and Southern Indiana operates 15 tuition-free public charter high schools that support adult learners in completing their state-certified high school diploma. The Excel Center provides small classes on a flexible schedule and wraparound services. Leo's rigorous study of this program shows adults increase their earnings by 38%. What if Marsha would have just had access to one of these proven programs five years before finding Catholic Charities? Would her daughter have had to learn about the joys of running water? Probably not. In our country, we have the employment and training programs designed to increase the employment prospects of SNAP recipients. In 2016, only 3.3% of SNAP recipients who were subject to work requirements participated. States are not incentivized to invest in these programs. Which brings me to my second point. We need to scale up evidence-based solutions. Senators, you have access to resources that Catholic Charities, Action for a Better Community, and Goodwill does not. They've already done the hard work for you. They've provided you with solutions that give people a path to upward mobility. They've given you the answers. They've allowed researchers into their business. And now we owe it to them to let their evidence scale about what works. Family First and McVeeve laws give us good precedent for how we can put evidence first and make it actionable for providers. In both cases, federal law now requires providers to either use an evidence-based program or to build rigorous evidence. The clearinghouses verify the validity and strength of the research proving a program is impactful. This combination of legislation requirements plus a well-run clearinghouse shows us a path forward. As policymakers, we need you allocating public policy dollars to allow these evidence-based services to scale because they work. What bothers me most about Marsha's story is that while it is just one story, I know there are millions other just like her. I am asking you to put this evidence to work. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Jones-Brown. Good afternoon, Chairman Fetterman, Ranking Member Braun, and members of the committee. I am Lori Jones-Brown, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Executive Officer of Phil Abundance, a hunger relief organization serving five counties in southeastern Pennsylvania and four counties in southern New Jersey, and a member of Feeding America, a network of over 200 food banks in the country. I'm here to share why passing a bipartisan farm bill is critical to the food, the food security of our neighbors in need and the well-being of our nation's economy and food system. Like all of you this morning, I did not make the difficult choice between breakfast or paying my light bill. But for many of our neighbors, these are the tough choices they make every day, choosing between food and keeping the lights on. When I spend time visiting our 600 plus community partners and the neighbors we serve, what I see is that people are scared. They are worried about not having a basic thing like food. Margo, the founder of the Sunday Love Project, one of our partners said, we're noticing an incredible influx of new clients. We're serving 120 to 150 people per day. There's a sense of desperation that's heightened. People are lining, are lining up earlier. There's a feeling of scarcity that didn't exist before. People are panicked. It's important to understand that all of the federal nutrition programs work together. Any cuts to TFAP, CSFP, or SNAP, and any policies that make these programs inaccessible for the people who need them the most only puts pressure on food banks to fill the gap. 
We are seeing the pressure today with the increased demand at food banks as the SNAP emergency allotments and other temporary federal supports have come to an end and at a time of high inflation. This makes lines at our partners at our pa partners pantries longer, and that is why we must increase funding for TFAP, improve CSFP, and strengthen SNAP. At Phil Abundance, we take a holistic approach to nourishing our communities. Through our backpack program that helps kids have a healthy start, our work with seniors to provide shelf-stable food, and our partnerships with healthcare organizations, we know that access to good nutrition and food is vital to improving the health outcomes for low-income families. We must continue to support these critical nutrition programs to ensure that vulnerable populations have access to the food they need. We also run a culinary job training program that receives support from SNAP Employment and Training. What we have learned is that when you invest in people by providing training and support, that can lead to self-sufficiency. Then you can create a pathway out of poverty. I'm here to tell you that it takes time, patience, and that critical investment to provide people with the tools needed to gain skills to find jobs. These investments, not harsh work requirements, are what truly support work and financial stability. We see it every day, the struggle for working families to make ends meet when too often their pay is not enough to cover their basic needs. One neighbor told us, I work full time and by the time I pay my bills, I have nothing left. I don't make a lot and I'm only eligible for $90 in SNAP benefits a month. People are cobbling together their take home pay with SNAP and emergency food resources and sometimes that isn't even enough. During the pandemic, what we learned is that bipartisan leadership to address hunger works. Because the government made bold investments in addressing hunger, more people were fed at a time of high need. And according to the USDA, food insecurity did not increase. Here's what I'm asking you to consider today. That you draft a bipartisan farm bill that strengthens the federal nutrition programs, adopt policy changes that build on innovations and lessons learned during the pandemic, center the participant experience and equity, and remove red tape to simplify program access and operations. Specifically, I ask that you strengthen TFAP funding. As demand for food remains high at food banks, a reliable, continuous stream of TFAP food is essential. Congress should reauthorize increased funding to $500 million per year in mandatory funding for food, for food purchases for TFAP. This level of investment will ensure the flow of TFAP foods remains steady throughout the Food Assistance Network and support the U.S. agricultural economy as TFAP bonus and other programs are dwindling. Protect SNAP's funding and structure while addressing systematic barriers to benefits. SNAP is our best defense against hunger. It is the most effective and efficient way to ensure people have access to the food they need and want. The Farm Bill must strengthen SNAP, um, and any cuts to its program cannot be made up by local food banks. We are already concerned with how we'll meet the need with the emergency allotments coming to an end. Reauthorize, streamline, and expand access for CSFP. A program that serves our seniors should be much easier to navigate. And support partnerships with growers and producers. We can help people who are hungry and farmers at the same time by strengthening the TFAP Farm to Food Bank program, which is based on a program that had great success in Pennsylvania. It is in our nation's best interest that we have well-nourished communities so they can thrive. That is why I'm here asking you to work together to pass a strong bipartisan farm bill um, that ensures equitable and consistent access to food. I often quote Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? With this farm bill, we can do something. We can feed people together. Thank, thank you, Mr. Whitford. Chairman Fetterman, Ranking Member Braun, and Subcommittee members, thank you for allowing me to testify today. 23 years ago, my wife and I uh, started a small ministry in Southwest Missouri that's grown quite a bit over the last two decades. Today, we offer emergency shelter services. We have a long-term recovery program for men focused on character development and work readiness. We have a family center that helps moms and kids struggling with homelessness. We even have a respite unit where folks that are coming out of the hospital discharging but don't have anywhere to go, they're able to come into our respite unit. We also have a robust food ministry where we're helping hundreds of families in our area with tens of thousands of pounds of food every year. But the thing that I want to communicate today that I think is so important is that a majority of the needs that are met through our mission are earned by people through our worth shop. This is a ministry that we run where people are crafting goods, they're creating things that go to market, and they're actually earning the very basics of food, shelter, clothing, and the like. Work awakens worth. That's why we call it a worth shop. And what we found is that you're either at work or you're in dependency. It's one or the other. 
I don't know if you've heard of the book Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton, but he talks about five steps to dependency. If you give something to somebody once, they'll appreciate it. If you give the same thing to that person again, they'll anticipate that you're going to do it a third time. If you give it a third time, they're going to have an expectation that you'll do it a fourth. If you give it a fourth time, they'll feel entitled to it, and a fifth time, they'll be dependent on you for it. It's appreciation, anticipation, expectation, entitlement, and dependency. I have seen that downward track for far too many people. And after more than 20 years of working among the poor and now working with leaders across the nation in various cities who are also fighting poverty, I'm convinced that we are in a national crisis of dependency. In fact, I would say that dependency is a national epidemic. Consider for just a moment that there are more people who are dependent on federal anti-poverty programs than there are people living in poverty. Just in the food stamp program alone, we have five million people dependent on it who are above the poverty line. Not to mention that if we look at those who are below the poverty line, which is about 37 million Americans, almost all of them are dependent on the government in some form or another, 96%. And a Pew Charitable Foundation study found that about 70% of them will never escape. What that means is that we have about 24.8 million Americans today who are on a trajectory to die in dependent poverty. Dependency is a national epidemic. Marvin Olasky, in his book, The Tragedy of American Compassion, The Tragedy of American Compassion, he wrote aptly. He said, dependency is merely slavery with a smiling mask. I believe that FDR would have agreed in his 1935 State of the Union address, he compared dependence on relief as a subtle narcotic, a destroyer of the human spirit. Now, FDR said it, but I know a woman named Jocelyn who actually lived it. For 10 years, actually more than that, she was a, a needle drug addict living on the streets, came into our mission, came to faith in Christ, got clean, but she didn't give up her food stamps. It was a lot of work for us to convince her that she had the ability to provide for herself. And when she finally did voluntarily give up her food stamp card, her trajectory changed. She ended up going to college, got her master's degree, and now she runs one of our shelters. You can imagine reporters were interested in doing a story. And there before the camera, in, a report, in an interview with a reporter, she said, it was harder for me to give up food stamps than it was for me to give up heroin. Dependency is a form of slavery that's holding millions of Americans back from living the flourishing life that God intended. And for Jocelyn, her dignity, her freedom, the flourishing life she lives, it didn't come through welfare or food stamps. It came through faith, friendships, and work. And let me leave you with this last comment from a woman I met last week named Selena, who is also homeless. And she said, I just want to thank you for doing the things the way that you do them. Allowing me to work for my bed and my meals has allowed me to feel like I can keep my dignity. For Selena, it's the same. She also will step into the flourishing life through faith, friendship, and work. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ms. Hasty. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitley Hasty. And I'm honored to be here today to share how the Supplemental Nutrition Program has positively impacted the lives of me and my children. I want to thank you, Chair Fetterman, Chairwoman Stabenow, Ranking Senator Braun, and for having me, the hearing and having me here to testify. I'd like to thank my own Senator, Senator Gillibrand, for continuously championing solutions to end hunger. I'm the proud mother of a seven-year-old daughter. She is sweet, protective, hilarious and cautiously independent. My three-year-old son is the opposite of her. He's grounded, generally likes to follow the rules, and has such an unlimited curiosity about everything. They're the center of my world, and I do everything I can to be present and active in their lives, from going to gymnastics, to hosting sleepovers, to becoming the vice president of the PTSO at our local school. I work really hard to model for my kids the importance of civic and community duty. And I'm raising my children the way my mother raised me, she never, almost never, missed a day of work and still made time to support four children in multiple activities in three different schools. She earned a modest salary, but would often bluntly and still describes our upbringing as one flat tire away from eviction. We often do not see the sacrifices our parents make until we grow up and make them ourselves. 
With the help of SNAP, we were able to shop for healthier foods rather than get by on just the basics. As the oldest, I learned how to grocery shop on a limited budget and still maximize the nutritional value of our meals. Working since the age of 13, I've always craved the independence that comes with making an honest income. Even during college, while on scholarship, I held down two jobs while I worked at the dining campus hall and at Wegmans. My resume is lengthy because I've always been willing, able, and ready to work. I'm proud of my strong work ethic and career advancement, but also know that much of what I've accomplished could not have been achieved without SNAP. In 2015, I obtained both SNAP and WIC during my prenatal care, and applying for both processes were really difficult. The two applications being separate meant that I missed work twice and lost wages to be appear at DHS at 8 a.m., only to wait in line for hours and, um, with, among other families. I'm grateful to the caseworker who helped me navigate this process, and I know the staff were trying to make this process as seamless as possible, but I do understand why some eligible participants are too intimidated to apply. That's why I support Senator Gillibrand's proposal to make it easier for states and counties to enable eligible people to apply for multiple programs simultaneously online. Receiving SNAP absolutely helped my family eat healthier. We ate less processed foods, and I started making different recipes. And I used, I used SNAP to shop not only at grocery stores, but also at farmers and mobile markets like Food Link's curbside mobile market. I utilized incentive programs to maximize my budget and help prioritize fruits and vegetables through programs such as the Double Up Food Bucks, which is funded partially through the USDA GUSNIP grant. When the pandemic hit, I was grateful to receive an increase in my SNAP benefits. My son was born two months earlier, and then the whole world turned upside down. The SNAP emergency allotments provided by Congress enabled me to stretch my food budget so I could keep the heat and the lights on. I'm a perfect example how legislation reduced poverty and hunger during one of the largest economic collapses of our lifetimes. My life refutes the most common SNAP myth. Receiving benefits was never a deterrent for me to work. I continually worked or sought work while receiving SNAP, and that is true of most SNAP recipients. A close old friend of mine recently celebrated the achievement of financial security when she no longer qualified for SNAP, and I can relate to that. If Congress wants to reduce the use of SNAP, it should raise the minimum wage, increase earned income tax credit, and boost wage, childcare, and transportation subsidies. I'm proud that my work at Hunger Free America and Food Link has, met that on, has meant not only that I no longer need SNAP, but that I can pay it forward by helping my community to access those benefits as well. Every day I witness how the recent end of the SNAP emergency allowance has impacted the diverse communities that I serve. Overnight, the minimum monthly benefit for many seniors fell from $281 to $23. My hope is that this esteemed body again increase the SNAP benefits to better help struggling Americans cope with skyrocketing costs for rent, utilities, childcare, and yes, food. I'm thankful that SNAP and WIC helped my family through challenging times and that I'm now able to give my kids a bright future. I hope my story encourages you to strengthen SNAP in the Farm Bill. In my written testimony, I will also include a few policy proposals supported by both Hunger Free America and Food Link that would improve the lives of many in both my neighborhood and in the nation. And it remains a vital truth that medicine is food and it should still be regarded as such. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. And now we will now begin the five minute rounds of questions for each member. And I will begin with my own now. Uh, Mrs. Cox, currently states allow SNAP mostly to, to do what they fit. And I'm concerned about, this, about proposals to limit this. My own state of Pennsylvania has the ability to seek waivers on work requirements and times and depending on employment metrics. This, is, this also includes tools that to ensure that low wage working household avoiding a benefit cliff. Can you possibly explain the potential impact if these proposals would have on states? Yes, thank you for the question. So when we think about the waivers, I think while unemployment has come down across the country, there are still areas that have higher unemployment and so it can, um, and states have the, you know, each state has experienced some crisis, whether it's a natural disaster, uh, um, 
plant closing, some community conditions that have persistent high unemployment, specifically like in Native American communities. And so that means people can't find jobs where these waivers are needed. States can only request temporary waivers for areas with relatively high unemployment and a lack of sufficient jobs. And states are really in the best position to evaluate the needs of their communities. And so that's why it's really critical to maintain states' flexibility when you respond so that they can respond to their communities needs. And then on the other hand around flexibilities, for example, the asset limit, the broad-based categorical eligibility, um, a lot of states that have expanded the income limit, it's basically for working families. So families who are just above the poverty line, but because of high shelter or childcare costs, at the end of the day, they meet um, the eligibility for SNAP and they're able to receive um, benefits. So taking that away, we saw when the Trump administration sought to pursue these reforms, it was gonna estimate 3 million individuals were actually gonna lose SNAP. So when you um, look at income, asset limit, so that mostly impacts older adults who have modest savings, so we would be asking them to um, not be able to have a savings in order to get uh, SNAP, and so that, you know, the state's flexibility is super important because states are in the better position to tell what they need in their state. Well, thank you, Mrs. Cox, and uh, I'd actually have one more kind of a brief, uh, another question, please. You know, many SNAP households have had benefits stolen through skimming, Victims face the serious challenge of losing their purchase power. When debit cards are skimmed, they are protections for the car holder. What, can, what needs can be done to ensure that families have that same kind of can, being protecting? Right, so there's been a lot of skimming over the last few years. And so what's really important is that SNAP participants have the same consumer protections that everyone else has. If you have a debit or a credit card and you have protections for your um, purchases, the same should happen for EBT card users. I do wanna say I appreciate the quick action of Congress to restore stolen benefits, um, and that's over the next year or so. But we really wanna make sure that any new EBT protections and technology doesn't prevent um, uh, uh, participants for having access to their benefits. So I don't know if there's one particular solution. There may be a few. It could be chip card technology, improving the detection and elimination of some of the skimming devices that are in stores, training retailers. Um, but ultimately, we want SNAP EBT card holders to not be treated any differently than other um, uh, consumers in our, um, any less protections than other consumers. Thank you. Mrs. Jones-Brown, food banks are really critical for the support foundation of SNAP. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. The Emergency Food Assistance Pro Program, or TFAP, was established to provide emergency food assistance to low-income individuals. And these individuals may not qualify for SNAP, but they might need additional support. Food banks like Phil abundance and knowing personally you, the, the kind of quality of the work that you do in my own state. They, they distribute 85% of TFAP foods nationwide. As Americans struggle with high food costs, how have you been able to allow you to continue to provide food support? Um, thank you for the question. Um, and the reality is that food banks like Phil Abundance, our partners across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and really across the country, um, we heavily rely on um, the government food programs um, that support farmers across this country that also end up supporting us, enabling us to ensure that our neighbors get access to the f food that they need. And often it's produce that the, the folks are asking for. Um, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that as inflation has increased and there have been challenges with the food supply, food banks have found it harder and harder to get donations of food from the private sector or even to purchase food. And so government food becomes that much more important. We also saw that in the early days of the pandemic, the government providing additional supports that came through food banks enabled us to really stave off a huge increase in food insecurity. Um, and so that's why um, today we're calling on um, we're calling on a government to 
really increase the support for SNAP to ensure, I'm sorry, for TFAP to ensure that there are additional um, food support that's coming through to our state, to states, to our region and across the country. Thank you. And now I recognize Ranking Member Braun for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We measure, I think, um, food insecurity by trying to get it below 10%. We've not been able to do that. Uh, families with ch children, without, it's been 20 years, and we spend more. Uh, there are more participants in it. Um, that, to me, is something when we, such a good program, uh, we got to have metrics that honestly say what is happening. Uh, I'm disappointed that we haven't been able to do better with it. Uh, Ms. Reynolds, Mr. Whitford, take about 45 seconds each because I've got a second question. What are you seeing in the field? What are we doing wrong in Congress? Because it's stubbornly staying in a level where we can't get it down any lower. We first have to recognize that we need to feed people in order to make sure that people can have upward mobility. We know cognitively if we don't have someone's basic needs cared for, they cannot progress. But we can't stop there. Where we have to go next is making sure they have evidence-based programs to get them on a pathway out of poverty. Examples I mentioned, like Bridges to Success, Goodwill Excel Center, Catholic Charities Padua, those are all proven by rigorous evidence that they work to give low-income Americans a pathway out of poverty so they, five years from now, a few years from now, can be feeding their families and not needing SNAP benefits. Mr. Whitford. Senator Braun, I, I think that uh, you're right. Things have continued to increase in 1969. If we were going to look at the average uh, food stamp allotment for a person uh, with uh, dollars equated to today, it would be about $50. And now we're talking like 230 or something per person. So it's just continued to increase. The numbers have continued to increase. And I think really uh, going back to uh, even something that Mrs. Cox was saying about state flexibility, we do need to see more local control. Because truth be told, the people that are in my community, I know their needs much better than anyone else. And there are some folks who would benefit and, and do well, just as Ms. Hasty did, and, and, and utilizing these benefits fits correctly, and there are some who do not. And I'm the one in my community and those like me who understand that. There's a hundred-year-old adage that says intelligent giving and intelligent withholding are alike true charity. Sometimes it's compassionate to say, no, we're not going to move in that direction. But right now, SNAP, TFAP, they tie your hands and you don't have that ability. So we need that ability, we need that local control so that communities can be effective in their charity work. Thank you. Ms. Reynolds, uh, in your written testimony, you share the story of three charitable organizations that Leo has partnered with, including down in my neck of the woods, the Goodwill XL Center of Central and Southern Indiana to study the effectiveness of holistic employment and training practices. Uh, you're, in your testimony, you also suggest that the USDA should leverage studies like yours to help move SNAP recipients out of poverty. I plan to introduce the Hand Up Act, uh, which would direct USDA to maintain a clearinghouse for evidence-based practices for SNAP employment and training. Do you believe this clearinghouse would improve SNAP's success at connecting recipients with long-term employment and a path out of poverty. I believe if you and I walk into our doctor's office and are giving, given a pill to handle an ailment we have, we deserve to make sure that that pill has undergone a certain level of testing to where we are protected. Right now, in many cases, when a poor person walks into an organization to receive food, they're given food. But then when they are given some sort of employment and training program, it doesn't have evidence behind it that it works. We need this evidence. If we don't have this evidence, we can't scratch our heads and wonder why are there still people not achieving upward mobility in our country? We have to give people in poverty programs that work. And one of the successful models for this has been McVeeve as well as Family First, where when you have federal law requiring that people use evidence or are creating the usage of evidence where it doesn't exist, paired with clearing houses that are set up that are actionable to all of us who are in the provider space as well, it can make a tremendous difference. Thank you. Mr. Whitford, uh, you want to weigh in on how this might dovetail with what you're doing? Well, yeah. Sure. I think, again, um, 
measuring evidence-based practice is incredibly important. And so uh, outcomes are incredibly important to measure. Uh, we, it's important among private charities. It's certainly going to be important among government programs. And I think that's what we've got to look at, not thinking that the efficacy of a program is uh, dependent upon the number of people that are enrolled in it, but rather the efficacy of a program being how many people got off the rolls and ended up back into the workforce. Thank you. Um, in wrapping up on my end of questioning, I think it's important because whatever we do here in the federal government, you've got to have metrics. If it's not producing the results, we all want the same end result. You're going to have to look at maybe other ways of doing it. And I'd like to highlight to anyone listening out there, we currently are in peril because of everything we spend here in the federal government. Just a little over four years ago when I got here, we were borrowing 20 cents on every dollar that we spend. Now it's up to 30 cents. And that's going to put in peril all the good things we do. So sooner or later, we're going to have to figure out better ways of doing it and making sure we're getting a better bang for our buck. Senator Stampinall. Well, thank you very much, Senator Braun and uh, Senator Bozeman. Wonderful, as always, to see my partner here. And Senator Fetterman, th I thank you so much for your leadership. Senator Booker, our former chair of the Nutrition Subcommittee, we've, we've got a, a great team. Um, and let me just echo uh, what Senator Braun said in terms of evidence-based programs. I couldn't agree more. If, if that's what we do, we will get consensus. We will get bipartisan support and keep it based on evidence. That, that's what we need to do. I also wanted to thank uh, Ms. Hasty. Thank you so much for bringing a real life perspective to what we are, we are talking about and for um, your leadership and being a great role model for your, kid, role model for your children. So um, appreciate you very much. You know, our nutrition programs in the Farm Bill uh, provide a modest but incredibly important support for Americans who need to put food on their tables. And I appreciate all of you being here today uh, to be involved in this discussion. We know there are children and seniors and working families and veterans, people with disabilities who rely on programs like SNAP for an average of $6.10 a day to buy healthy food. And I'm reminded every time I go buy a cup of coffee for six bucks. So $6.10 a day is what we are talking about. Over 41 million vulnerable Americans rely on these modest benefits, and most of them are temporary during tough times. I want to specifically address something that has been talked about a lot, particularly by uh, House colleagues, House leadership, and just say, newsflash, SNAP has work requirements. And as Senator Braun said, it's been general work requirements have been in law since 1977. They were strengthened uh, during uh, uh, President Clinton's time at 19, in 1996 as part of welfare reform. Time limits were added for adults without children, as we know, uh, so that unless they are working 80 hours per month, uh, they uh, or now we say or in a job training program, that you can only receive three months of SNAP during three years, three years. That, that's current law, suspended under COVID, just as we su suspended other work requirements, now coming back in July. And so that's the basis from which we are operating, is that we have work requirements that have been supported on a, on a bipartisan basis. The Farm Bill has always provided a safety net for our farmers and our families our farmers and our families. And I believe strongly that it's critical that both safety nets continue. So Ms. Cox, I have a, Cox, I have a question for you. Um, the administration reevaluated the Thrifty Food Plan, which is the basis for the SNAP benefit, uh, based on current food prices, which you know have been going up, not down, uh, consumption patterns, food, composition data, dietary guidelines, how much time we spend cooking from scratch. I don't even know if people know what that is anymore <laughs> when you say that term. Um, but uh, but uh, this was required as part of the bipartisan 2018 Farm Bill. First comprehensive update since 1975. 1975 to really look at all of it. What is the impact of the reevaluation and why was this meaningful to do? 
Thank you, um, Senator Stabenow, for that question. So the revision to the Thrifty Food Plan, which was a directive from the 2018 um, Farm Bill, it really served as a critical and much needed long overdue revision, right? As you said, from 1975, it hadn't been reevaluated and we really looked differently at how much time families have to uh, purchase food. And we also looked at dietary guidelines differently now than we did in the 70s. So looking at green vegetables, orange vegetables, whole grains, buying lean proteins and seafood. So that was also used and taken into account. And as a result, you know, there was an increase. I think what's really important, as you mentioned about the modest benefit amount, while it's modest, it was a meaningful um, increase. And what we found is that that amount lifts some 2.4 million people, including 1 million children above the poverty line. Um, and it decreased food insecurity for tens of millions. So while we made a modest increase, although important, we really um, show what we can do and how we can lift people out of poverty by just making that revision, which was much needed. Thanks so much. And then finally, Ms. Jones-Brown, uh, thank you for all your work. At food Bank work so important. You're on the front lines of fighting food insecurity. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about who you typically serve at your food bank and whether uh, that population has changed over time. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question, Senator. Um, what we saw over the last few years is that more and more of our neighbors found themselves accessing the Charitable Food Network. Early in 20, in the middle of 2020, we saw 60% more people lining up to access food across our region, um, but across the country as well. And 40% of them were newly food insecure. Mm -hmm. So chances are somebody you know. If there was a restaurant you used to go to, if there was a, um, a a service provider, a small business owner, chances are for the first time in their lives they were accessing the Charitable Food Network. And so we've seen the face of hunger change in our country. Um, we know that, um, as we saw from the USDA study, that far too many families with children um, are food insecure. We know far too many of our seniors and our veterans are food insecure. We're seeing also more and more that working folks are. One of the last um, pantries I visited right before Easter, I walked in and I saw someone there who I thought was maybe donating food, um, who was actually in full uniform and was actually shopping for free food at the pantry. And days before, his company had actually donated to, to Phil Abundance. And so the reality is, is that more and more we're finding people that are working, that are just having a hard time making ends meet, particularly with the price of eggs, um, they're coming to access the Charitable Food Network. So I would dare say everybody in this room knows somebody who at some point, probably in the last year or two, had to come to us to ask for help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks to uh, Chairman Fetterman and Ranking Member Braun for holding the hearing. It's interesting. I think the right now the base of the farm bill is $1.5 trillion. $1.2 trillion has to do with food assistance. So this is something that's really very, very important. And we appreciate you all being here and sharing your expertise. Ms. Hasey, thank you for sharing, uh, as I said, your expertise, your experience. Uh, with SNAP and WIC today. It's always good to hear directly from those that have been impacted by these, these programs. I'm also glad to hear that SNAP helped you and your family bridge the gap, which is really what this is all about uh, and advance, helped you advance in your career. Um, that's exactly what the program is, is meant to do. In your time working towards your current career, what were the most important things that helped you move from making ends meet to stable employment. What what aspects of the program were helpful, and maybe uh, some areas that that weren't so helpful? Thank you for the question, and thanks again for allowing me to speak. Um, I like I said in uh, my testimony. I think one of the barriers um, would be the application process. I mean, um, uh, having to take time off of work, uh, losing wages to appear, and then you know, if it's easier for me to leave my children at home, paying someone to watch my children while I go and stand in line for a long time and uh, apply. I mean, it was, everyone was really helpful in, in that process, um, but that was a difficulty. I think, as anyone will tell you, receiving SNAP, there's also living with the stigma of being labeled as someone who has failed. So um, that was not an easy aspect of it, but I'm proud of the fact that I was able to support my family with the help of SNAP, I think every time um, I earned 
uh, like a higher wage, I was, you know, I can look back and reflect and see that I can attribute that to the way in which it helped me stretch my budget and keep paying my bills and not have to, you know, continue to pay late rent fees and things like that. So um, it's, it's, it's been progressive, but yeah. Well, you've, the other thing too I wanted to ask you about, and you touched on it, you know, you've been an ambassador at, at the curbside market and truly have firsthand experience in reaching those who may be in a need of assistance to WIC and SNAP. Tell me, you mentioned the paperwork. What Are there other barriers that you're finding uh, so that we can capture those folks that, uh, that do need help that uh, haven't signed up for WIC or SNAP? Barriers to? To their participation. Uh, in other words, the, the, partition, the participation is really under. So, although I know WIC is not part of the Farm Bill, but my actually uh, experiences in allowing, uh, helping people access benefits to WIC, I know that there are barriers to um, participation in a lot of, in both of those programs, but particularly in the, the communities that I serve and the individuals that I try to help, um, barriers would be um, the I'm sorry, the, applica the application process, I'm sorry, um, and. Well, I suppose so. I mean, uh, the other aspect would be, you know, the fact that you are out telling people that it actually exists. It's hard for us to understand probably that there are people that don't really know, you know, what's going on and that the, the program's available. Right. Um, Again, I th in my experience, I work right now with helping people access WIC. Again, I know it's not part of the Farm Bill, but um, in, um, oh, very good. Sorry. No, no, thank you. Real quickly, Ms. Reynolds, um, you emphasize the need to scale up programs, evidence-based programs like Padua, Bridges to Success, Goodwill Excel Center. What are the barriers to expanding these expanding programs in other regions while also keeping in mind that one size doesn't fit all? Uh, how do you think these types of programs might work in our rural areas that are desperately in need? Yeah, thank you for your question. As a fellow Arkansan, um, I appreciate the rule nod as well. Um, I would say a couple of things. The first thing I would say is that most, Leo has built a tremendous amount of evidence around individualized case management that is holistically focused on the family. And what that allows to have happen is the path forward isn't just this is what you need and everybody gets this. But the path forward often is understanding each family where they're at, understanding what their today needs are, what their tomorrow needs are, and maybe their needs a year from now, and, and doing life with them for a longer period of time to get them into upward mobility, the living wage income, those sorts of things. So what we have found is that these solutions, like Goodwill Excel Center, like Catholic Charities Fort Worth, they're showing solutions that are case management paired with flexible financial assistance plus wraparound services, and they tend to be very then customized within that um, for getting to an upward mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And now I recognize Senator Kobachar. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Fetterman. Thank you for holding this really important hearing. Um, uh, Ms. Brown, during the full committee hearing on nutrition, um, I asked Undersecretary Dean about her experience at a Minnesota SNAP employment and training site, and she uh, spoke very positively uh, about our uh, model and even suggested it could be good to uh, bring out to the rest of the country. I understand you're also familiar uh, with the collaborative work we're doing between federal, state, and local. Uh, can you talk about in more detail how this kind of program helps participants overcome barriers to employment? Absolutely, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, at Phil Abundance, we operate a community kitchen that is supported by um, SNAP employment and tra training programs. So everyone in, the, they're all adults, they're all either 
on SNAP or eligible for SNAP. It's a free 16-week program. We have um, very positive results, people that um, stand in the graduation rates and then getting jobs. What we talk about is that we teach people what we say, both knife skills and life skills. Because mm -hmm. um, there are very limited, low barriers to entry. People have been through the criminal justice system or in some cases had um, had a health issue, um, had an injury, and had to change change opportunities um, or change trajectories. Um, we Through this program, we also um, have a catering operation email production like other Catalyst Kitchens across the country. And what we found with that is that our participants are learning not just to cook, they're also learning about nutrition, um, and they're also providing meals, much needed meals, um, healthy meals to people who are food insecure across the region. Okay, very good. Um, just second question. Uh, food banks in Minnesota like Second Harvest, Heartland, which has seen a 40% reduction, about 7 million fewer pounds in federal commodities in the last year. It's very important that, as you know, the program remains responsive to excess supply and increased demand we're seeing, in part because of prices, to purchase bonus commodities at times of high need for emergency food relief. Uh, Ms. Brown, uh, in addition to times of low commodity prices, goes either way. Ms. Brown, could you speak to the importance of the USDA regular TFAP spending and CCC purchases and their role in ensuring our food banks have consistent access to food? Um, thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. It's critically important for us to be able to meet um, the need of our neighbors, um, that we have access to government foods. We actually have seen that decrease, and we're seeing it decreasing now. At the height in the last two years, um, we received about 19 million pounds of food from government that we were able to get out into our neighborhoods to ensure that our neighbors had access to fresh, healthy food, primarily produce, which is really support helpful for um, ensuring that they're nutrient. Um, they're healthy and providing nutritious food to them. This calendar year alone, it looks like we might, we're on track to get maybe 5 million pounds. At the same time, we're trying to um, purchase additional food. With the economy being what it is, it's costing us more. So really, TFAP, um, the TFAP programs are a lifeline um, for us to ensure that our neighbors have access to food. Okay, very good. Thank you. Last question, Ms. Cox. Uh, as you know, the 2018 Farm Bill authorized the Healthy Fluid Milk in Incentives Pilot uh, to encourage the consumption of milk, uh, which we all know is part of a well-rounded diet. Uh, the, HMF, the HFMI pilot builds on the success of previous incentive programs uh, like GUSNIP, which have been shown to positively impact purchasing decisions. With such a high demand for additional nutrient-rich dairy products like yogurt and cheese, what opportunities exist to expand the reach of the program to include more dairy products nationwide? Thanks for the question, Senator. So yeah, the GUSNIP program, which in the last Farm Bill actually did receive an increase, that's one of the pretty one of the pretty much one of the strongest um, uh, programs that we'll be able to use or we can access for participants to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, to healthy um, to healthy foods as well as milk. While the um, healthy, f I will have to probably get back to you a little bit on the healthy fluid because I don't think we know as much about that, but I do know enough about the GUSNIP that there was more money placed in it in the uh, last Farm Bill, and that's really the place where we're seeing a lot of results. We're seeing the Double Up Bucks program and just the place where people are able to access fresh fruits and vegetables, even at farmer's markets. Okay. Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator. And we now recognize Senator Booker for five minutes. Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm really grateful to be here, and I loved the testimony that we heard uh, today. I just want to say very clearly, first and foremost, it's important that we protect SNAP. I think I'm one of the small handful of senators that live in a very low-income neighborhood, and I see every day uh, the profound difference that SNAP makes in the lives of people who are working hard, who are struggling to make it. We live in a country where just finding housing, you have to make more than twice the minimum wage in my state just to be able to afford uh, your housing needs, and we are seeing in my communities across New Jersey how SNAP is a powerful program that needs to be protected and, frankly, needs to be expanded. Uh, I think the United States of America is outrageous that people who have drug convictions can't get SNAP. People who admitted doing the same things that presidents have now said they've done, senators have said they've done, so privileged folks who don't get drug enforcement like we see in communities like mine uh, don't lose their federal eligibility for a lot of things. 
We believe in redemption in this country, but yet we hold people time and time again who are formerly uh, incarcerated to higher levels uh, than, than uh, reflects that spirit and that value. There are places like Puerto Rico. Each and every one of those people are Americans, and they should have the same access to vital programs like this. We are facing in this country also uh, not just a hunger crisis, but a nutrition crisis. We have an explosion of diet-related diseases, and we know that if we want to try to save costs in this country, one out of every three government dollars right now is being spent on health care, and the overwhelming majority of that is diet-related diseases. And so what we're seeing is programs that I believe need to be expanded, like GusNip, for example, are actually getting people off of their prescription drugs. We have an urban farm in the South Ward of Newark, New Jersey, that I was there filming the documentary uh, Food Inc., Food Inc. 2, and you had just people volunteering coming up talking about how they had hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of prescription drugs. Their copay was $100, one woman was telling me, but over $700 that she was off of her, uh, uh, her prescription drugs when she started getting access to fresh, healthy food. So I love, uh, Ms. Reynolds, you're the evidence-based. We, we know what works in communities, but we're putting up artificial barriers, uh, as was being said by Ms. Hasty. Artificial barriers are making it really difficult for the people we need. These are our children. Ms. Cox, you said it so well. Nutritious, healthy diets help people in their brain development years. Not access to health, healthy, fresh foods actually undermines brain development. So SNAP is great. It needs to become a nutrition program. That's what one of the letters in SNAP stands for. And I believe we need to do a lot more, making quality, diet quality and nutrition the core of SNAP objectives, scaling up programs like GusNip and more. And so just really quick in the little bit of time I have left, uh, I, I just would like to say, can we talk about the challenges that are being faced by people at Phil Abundance, uh, uh, Ms. Brown, that, that in getting access to those fresh, healthy foods that are vital to the strength of our families and the potential competitiveness of them for the long term. Um, thank you very much, Senator, for the question, and um, we absolutely agree with you, and it's why in your state and in Pennsylvania, um, we've actually challenged ourselves. We put out what we call our good food policy. We're holding ourselves accountable to distribute even more nutritious food. Um, and interestingly, research tells us that's what our neighbors want and what they need. Now, obviously, in the communities that we serve, um, there is a dearth of grocery stores and sometimes farmers markets, and that's why we want to make sure that we are, through programs like TFAP and other programs, getting more access to more produce that we're getting out to folks. Interestingly, it's what people are asking for. Each and every time I talk to a neighbor at need in a pantry, they're asking me for produce. They want fresh fr fruits and vegetables. I think there's a myth that people don't want that. And so people are asking for collard greens or sweet potatoes or carrots. Um, and so we're attempting to provide that. We also, in addition to providing the free food to folks, um, we also are working with a number of partnerships with grocery stores, with healthcare. We're providing healthy meals, health, uh, medically tailored meals, um, and then working with grocery stores to see if there's other ways we can get people access to benefits like SNAP while also getting the access to the food that they need. Excellent. And can I just ask you, I want to stay with you, Ms. Brown. My time's out, but I want to ask one last question. One out of every three women incarcerated on the planet Earth is in the United States of America. We're the land of the free, but we incarcerate women, overwhelmingly women who have been survivors of sexual violence, sexual trauma. 95 to 98% of them coming home. They've got children that they've been separated from that often end up in multiple different foster homes. And we know, against evidence-based, as Ms. Reynolds said, <laughs> that when you do things to strengthen the connection with their children, they have lower recidivism rates. And, and they're more successful. How does it make sense? And, and again, I'm a man of faith, so I believe in the prodigal story of the prodigal child. But how, how does it make sense in our, in our society that we take that woman, a survivor of sexual trauma, over-incarcerated with mandatory minimums for crimes, again, Definitely. that many privileged people do every day, yeah. and then when they come home and they're trying to reconnect with their children, we deny them the basic benefits to get access to fresh, healthy foods. Does that make any sense from not just a policy perspective or a moral perspective, but does it make sense from an economic perspective at, at all? Um, 
It doesn't. And one of the things we found is that when we provided people with additional supports, like SNAP, um, when, with the SNAP emergency allotments, I think in Pennsylvania, that meant $200 million each month additionally going into grocery stores. So even if you think about the economic impact of these programs, the reality is that for every dollar we're investing in SNAP, one, $1.50 or $1.80 is coming back into our community. And that justice involved woman getting herself back on her feet to work. We found with the child tax credit, Canada's data shows that it actually increased workforce participation for the women. The, the SNAP for a justice-involved woman getting eligibility for that empower them to be uh, uh, successful earners? Um, I, I think that's right. And I think the reality is, um, you, you know, I appreciate the, the moral issue. I, too, am I'm a person of faith and really feel honored and privileged that we get to do this work every day. Um, and that, you know, I, I fully believe we've learned a lot of lessons over the last several years. I appreciate the le your leadership in Senator Braun's with the White House Conference um, on hunger, nutrition, and health. And I believe we can solve hunger. Um, and I can believe that we can take what works. And we've seen a lot of things that are working across this country. We've seen government work. Um, and I think... Um, the reality is we have so much in this country, we can ensure that our neighbors have what they need to, to thrive. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, thanks for the indulgence. Well, thank you, Senator. And now I recognize Senator Gillibrand for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Booker, for your commitment to such an important issue. Um, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Ms. Hasty a bit. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about more your story, um, what work you were doing at the time, what work you were looking for, did SNAP improve your job security? Did it improve your economic self-sufficiency? Did you ever feel that SNAP created a cycle of benefit dependency? Um, and what recommendations would you make to improve the SNAP program? Thank you. Um, so in addition to raising my children, um, during the time that I received SNAP, I was consistently uh, working an average of 34 hours a week. and. Um, at that time, you know, when I was able to work, and the last full-time job I held while receiving SNAP actually mandating, um, had mandatory overtime. Um, so I had both full-time jobs and simultaneous part-time jobs, but I had a total of five different employers, so variety of work. Um, without it, I wouldn't have been able to pay my rent, or it would have been late. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, when we, di we didn't miss a meal, we worked harder, I worked harder, my kids played harder, and um, SNAP has helped me to earn more, I think, each time that I, uh, you know, advanced in my career, as modest as it was. Um, in terms of a cycle of dependency, I think that's, that's common language, um, but it feels like a deflection from the real economic problems that we're facing. Um, I always sought to strengthen my skills and grow professionally, so, um, I know what it feels like, like I would mentioned before, to kind of feel like you've done something wrong to be accepting or to, to, to have that type of help. I mean, even in the grocery line, using your SNAP card or using your WIC card holding up the line, that's a, a real reality. Um, I wonder how many people in this room or watching have ever woken up and drank in a bottle of water to make themselves feel full until they knew they were going to eat that one time at the kitchen that they worked at. Because... I've had to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that SNAP and other programs designed to alleviate hunger and poverty are just proof that we all deserve um, a, a standard of living that lets us live healthier and happier. So we know that SNAP works. It needs to be expanded. And um, I never thought that it was going to be permanent. Um, and even when I didn't understand the definition of uh, what an entitlement program was, I understood that the more that my income increased, the less net benefits I got. And the reason I was happy about that is because I was, you know, like I said, it's, it's almost celebrated um, that when, when you're no longer, re you know, receiving benefits. Um, and I was really proud to start earning a salary that exceeded those, those income limits. So I think improvements to SNAP would obviously be um, streamlining application processes so that so that it makes it easier for people, um, uh, better communication about what the program entails and who's eligible for it, and um, you know, not imposing uh, absurd work, you know, ex um, the ex extra work requirements, I suppose, or work reporting requirements, um, and 
allowing people to have a more diverse purchasing power with the things that they can purchase with it. So online retailers, um, farmer markets, and there's more detail about that in the um, written testimony that I've prepared. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hasty. the SNAP benefit today is only $6.10 a day. Obviously, you can't feed yourself and two kids on $6.10 a day. So talk to me a little bit about how SNAP supplemented what you were able to buy from your income and from your earnings, and what difference SNAP actually made to being able to buy more healthy foods for your children and yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously a supplemental program. Mm -hmm. so we, we know that it's not meant to be your entire food budget every month. Mm -hmm. um, I think the difference with and without SNAP, if you kind of picture going to the grocery store without SNAP, um, you, know, you have to think about how much money should be left so that that utility bill could be paid. So without SNAP, um, you might only purchase bread, milk, and eggs because you know that you can you know, eat those things for the... The, the rest of the week, but with SNAP, it kind of just gives you more, more flexibility. You can buy fruits and vegetables and have raw fruits and vegetables in your, in your house and not just have the basic staples. So it, it just gives you more, more, flex, more for, you can focus more on the nutrition instead of just kind of making these impossible choices. Thank you, Ms. Hasty. And just last uh, for Dr. or for Mrs. Jones, um, can you talk a little bit about um, students who need access to SNAP and also the importance of making sure that we move Puerto Ricans from NAP to SNAP? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. Um, what we see, we, we, work, we do our work at, at our food bank and with food banks like ours across the country with agency partners. So those are churches, mosques, synagogues, um, schools, um, community service organizations that end up distributing the food. The reality is in our network, we have a number of colleges and universities that, are also, that also have food pantries. So right in Senator Booker's um, district, we opened a food pantry at Rutgers Camden a couple of years ago. Um, so the reality is, is we have our college students that are, as they're trying to get an education so they can get a great job, um, that they're also food and housing insecure. And so we're able to support them um, through food banks like ours. I did not. Um, we ended up partnering um, with them. We're actually part of the same region, interestingly. Um, and through the USDA region, we're part of the same region. The Mid-Atlantic region includes them. And so they're one of our partners um, in this work. Um, they are part of our network of food of 200 food banks. And so we're able to share best practices um, about ways that we can um, ensure that our neighbors have access to the food that they need, not just um, in the continental U.S., but also in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you for crossing the Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> like Washington. That, that, thank you, Senator. And now I now recognize Senator Warnock for five minutes. Thank you, so, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and it's great to see you back. Uh, during the pandemic, Congress provided an emergency boost to food assistance programs uh, called emergency SNAP allotments. This boost ended in a number of states last month, but my own state of Georgia and many other states already ended this increase months ago. And after this uh, emergency food assistance was cut off in Georgia, uh, the Atlanta Community Food Bank, uh, which works very closely with my church, uh, saw visits increase by about 34%, 34%. When compared to the same period the previous uh, year, I visited the Atlanta Food Bank I've spent time um, with uh, the volunteers and the workers over at Hosea Feed the Hungry and Homeless and the work that they do. And I've seen those lines get longer as our policies got harsher. Mrs. Brown, food banks work hard to be a safety net uh, for our federal nutrition programs, but they're struggling uh, to keep up with increasing need. How would further cutting federal nutrition programs affect our food banks? Thank you very much for the question, Senator. Um, and as you saw with my, my counterpart, Kyle, at the Atlanta 
Community Food Bank, who I was with just yesterday, um, across the country, we have seen an increase. We saw an increase, obviously, early on in COVID in 2020, but then we also saw an increase with gas prices and inflation for food over the last year. So we just had that um, the emergency allotments go away in, in our states, and so we're anticipating increased need, but we've seen 30%, 50%, even twice as many people access the Charitable Food Network. Um, we have a number of churches that are part of our network as well. In fact, one of our churches that's a member is a church that I attend, Enon Tabernacle, where I believe that you are recently. Um, and we really could not do this work without our many partners. We're here today asking um, for a bipartisan bill that really ask government to partner with us. We are absolutely willing to raise the fund, get private donations, and leverage the thousands and thousands of volunteers that we have across the country. We really need government support. We need government support um, to really do what works. We saw what works. We saw how emergency allotments and other additional supports over the last couple of years helped our communities. So we're asking for those kinds of support. I'm going to ask an obvious question. So, so you don't have the bandwidth to fill in the gap. Um, we do not. Um, we really do need help. So we, we, got, we saw additional supports, millions more pounds of food came through TFAP to our food banks across the country um, during COVID. Um, and with that being pulled back, we're really concerned about how we're going to fill that. In the same way that everyday people are seeing um, prices go up in the grocery store, it's costing us more and more to purchase and transport food for our neighbors in need. And, and on top of that, some of my colleagues are talking about rolling back the Thrifty Food Plan update which increased food benefits by less than $2 per day, uh, but is expected to help keep 1 million children above the poverty line. Seems to me that we can't go uh, backwards in this farm bill, and I'll be doing everything I can to expand and protect uh, federal nutrition uh, benefits. And the, the time that I, I still have, uh, currently non-disabled adults without dependents are only eligible for SNAP for three months out of every three years unless they work 80 hours per month. Now, I believe the vast majority of SNAP recipients who are able to work do so, uh, but we need to bear in mind that most SNAP recipients are children, elderly, or disabled. Some of my colleagues in the House and also in the Senate have talked about expanding existing work requirements for SNAP. Ms. Cox, uh, can you tell us about these proposals and what the research says about existing work requirements that are already in place including whether they increase workforce participation. Thank you, Senator Warnock, for the question. Studies consistently demonstrate that taking benefits away from people who are not working or not meeting a work requirement does little to improve their long-term employment outcomes, um, especially those with limited um, employment opportunities. Instead, it increases hardship, including among people who are not even expected to work, like, the, like children and people with disabilities. There was a recent peer review paper showed that SNAP's time limit <coughs> reduced participation in the program by 53% percent um, for those who were subject to it with no effect on employment. Um, there was another recent paper about uh, no evidence of improved employment earnings, but it did find that SNAP participation was cut by 7 to 32 percentage points a year after the time limit was reinstated. And so, um, the you know, there's been consistent studies showing that it doesn't have an impact on earnings. You're it just, just takes away food. Takes away food from hungry people. Exactly. And you Many can't work if you're, you know, if you're hungry. Thank you so much. I hope we'll keep this in mind, keep the research and the actual data in mind as we write this year's farm bill. Thank you, Senator. And we now recognize Senator Marshall for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate all of our witnesses hanging through this lunch hour. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up every lunch in school that we got to drink whole milk. Too. I would actually get two cartons of whole milk and I hope that you all would support me that how important milk and the milk products are to the programs that, that you run. So just bear with me a moment here. Ah, so good. So let's start with uh, Dr. Whitford. Uh, my first question should be, how is Coach Self doing? But I assume you don't have any uh, exact knowledge, but I'm glad to let you know that I did speak to the chancellor yesterday and Coach Self is healing up very nicely and we're ready for next year's basketball season. You run the Watered Gardens Ministry. And I would just like to hear a little bit more about that. What, what, what is your mantra? What, what drives you to do it? Tell me about the success of it and, and what, what's that feel-good moment for you? 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, there are many feel-good moments in this kind of work that we do, but certainly uh, seeing people um, freed from poverty is the number one thing that we're excited to, to see. And right now we're seeing a lot of folks who are really struggling in chronic homelessness, a lot of mental health yeah. uh, issues, uh, addiction issues, and these types of things. And so uh, we have a very robust program where we're sitting down and getting to know people, very relational in nature, setting goals with them, and helping them up and out of poverty. You know, and we, we measure a lot. I think it's important yeah. that charities like mine are, are uh, outcome driven and really doing a good job of, of uh, measuring key performance indicators, and we do that. Interestingly, before the pandemic, we were seeing about 63, 64% of folks who would come into our shelter with no job at all leave with a job. And uh, over the last couple of years, that's changed. And so now we're really struggling to see people get back into the workforce. Uh, we're a little below 40% at this point of folks coming into shelter and then not leaving with a job. So what we track is successful exits out of our shelter have been dropped. So you've got to tell us why, how come, what, well, what are the barriers? Well, it, it really does seem that there's so much uh, government largesse that's pouring into our communities, and it's not just mine. I mean, I have 11 pages of testimony from uh, leaders across the United States that are fighting poverty that really are seeing perverse incentives from the amount of government help that's coming into the community. But it's not help that's able to discern. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a help that's investigative in nature. The very things we're doing with people on the ground in our own community, understanding the individual needs and what's really needed for that person, uh, is, government programs are not able to do that kind of work. And so it creates a perverse incentive that draws people toward it rather than toward the challenging developmental programs that are actually going to help them up and out of poverty. You know, coming from the Midwest, I, I think that a work ethic is part of our DNA. It's, it's part of, you know, the values that I was raised on. You're in Joplin, Missouri. I'll still call Missouri the Midwest, even though we, you're going to struggle with your basketball team a little bit over there, but I'm sure you're still rooting for the Jayhawks. Um, tell me, do you still see that uh, work ethic as a value that most of the people come into your your facility with that they want to get a job or, or where are they on no, the work part of this? No, no. I'm seeing a lot of people coming in that don't have any intention or desire to work. There is an entitlement mentality that's become pervasive in our nation. Oh. We see it come through the doors of our mission every day. And then what we have to do is we have to be great sources of inspiration yeah. and, re and to provide relational accountability in order to help people realize that they are created in the image of God, created in the image of a maker, and are therefore built and intended to make, to produce, and to contribute, not to be stuck on the receiving end of someone's benevolence. And then the long-term success, and you can define success how you want to, the folks that have a job, do they seem to be more fulfilled? Do they have purpose in life? Uh, are they bouncing back sooner? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and this is what we find. That's why we do work first. So you come into our mission, and we want to employ you right off the bat because we don't just see a person who's disabled or a person who's uh, lacking or lacking capacity, but people who have ability and capacity and potential. And when we start with employment, it begins to energize them because we're built for that. And so that's what leads to uh, better successful, out more successful outcomes. But again, it's a fight. There's a great tension in what we're trying to do. And I think some of the larger, more bureaucratic forms of help coming into our community. Well, great. It looks like my time's uh, wound down. We appreciate all the witnesses coming today. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Senator. I now recognize Senator Bennett for thank, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to see you in, in this role. Thank you for having me today. I'm not on the oh, committee, but I know how important I, this is. I, I thank, from the, thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. Um, Senator Marshall, my mom is proud of you for drinking that milk. Thank you. Thank you. Tell your mom hey. I will. I'll tell her. She's probably the only person. That's not true. I was going to say the only person watching this, but that's not true. She's... <laughs> She's not actually, she's not watching because she didn't know what you'd be doing. But I, 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 um, I just wanted to come by because before I was in this job, I was the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. 
and um, the vast majority of kids there were living in poverty. They still are. Um, and um, the problem there was not that people couldn't, didn't work. Uh, the problem was people were working two and three jobs, and no matter what they did, they couldn't get their kids out of poverty. And that's what's happening all over America in a country where, you know, we, we, are, the ri we are the richest country in the world, Mr. Chairman. It's true. And we have the worst income inequality that we've had since the 1920s in this country. We have the lowest economic mobility that we've had in generations and lower economic mobility. I'm sad to say this than many other industrialized countries in the world that we compare ourselves to. And do I think there are some people that don't work? Uh, if given the opportunity to work, probably. But I think what's, what's much more likely the case based on the parents, the families that I've worked with, is that people are working. People are killing themselves. They're not just working. Their kids are working. So when you're in a, in a family's house and you go, you know, you're the superintendent and you show up, and I did show up under these circumstances when kids weren't going to school, you know, the, on a morning after, and you'd say, well, why, you know, on a morning they'd miss school, and I'd say, well, why have you missed school? And they said, because I was working until 12 o'clock last night at McDonald's down the street. Because we don't have the sense to give kids in this country the opportunity to go to school when it makes sense for them. We have a one-size-fits-all approach to public education that makes it hard, I think, for kids, for working families to, to, to work in the ways that they want to work and be able to support their kids. I, I know Ms. Jones-Cox knows that we spent a lot of time working on the child tax credit a few years ago to uh, cut childhood poverty in this country uh, almost in half, which we did. When the Biden administration came in, we cut childhood poverty by 50 percent, most significant reduction in childhood poverty in American history. We reduced hunger in the United States by 30 percent, and we didn't add a single bureaucrat to the federal government to do it. It wasn't a bureaucratic program. It was just putting money in the hands of, of families to be able to spend them uh, as Ms. Hasty was talking about, in the best interest of their kids, you know, so that they could buy a little bit of extra relief at the end of the month when they're paying their rent, when they're paying their light bill, when they're paying for their, their food or for school clothes in the case of uh, kids that, you know, I represent in Colorado whose parents were saying this is the first time that, uh, that we've actually been able to provide school kids for our for our, for our school clothes for our kids. So from my point of view, you know, we, we, we are living in the richest country in the world, and our level of childhood poverty is criminal. It's inexcusable. It's immoral. It's unacceptable. And I think we should end it. I think cutting it in half was a good start, and I'm very sad that that came to an end. It worked. It did what we said it was going to do. And you know, for me, one of, and I'm not talking about people over on this side of the aisle, I, I'm talking about in the other House of Congress, to see people who blew up this deficit so that the wealthiest people in America could have tax cuts when we have the worst income inequality since the 1920s, that makes no sense to me. That's a handout that makes no sense to me when we have a solution for the childhood poverty that we are facing. And the idea that we'd be threatening to blow up our credit rating over um, the school lunch program or over SNAP doesn't make any sense to me. So, Ms. Cox, within my last 22 seconds, sorry to go on for so long, but, you know, to the, to the families in Colorado and to the, and to the and I guess what I'd say, just two things. One, is it true that there are no work requirements when it comes to when it comes to SNAP? And two, what's it going to mean to families? You know, two thirds of the folks that get SNAP are living in families with children in Colorado. What's it going to mean to those children if we cut these programs the way these folks have been talking about? Okay, real quick. So no, um, it is not true that there aren't current work requirements in SNAP. There are. We've been talking about them. There's a um, three-month time limit for individuals not working out of three months. So I mean, out of three years. So there is work requirements. And the second, um, the proposal that was uh, placed by uh, Representative Johnson 
For Colorado in specific, it would be 115,000 SNAP participants um, in households that would be at risk of losing SNAP. So if we're looking at those households with children seven and below, or we're looking at we're going from age 50 to 64. So it's a lot of people in Colorado that would be at risk of losing and, benefits. And I, just, and I know my time is up and I'm done, but let me just say I, what I saw when the child tax credit went away, the enhanced child tax credit went away, was food pantries just you know go up like this, skyrocket like this, and I think we're going to see the same thing here, Ms. Hasty. I don't know if you, if you had the benefit of the child tax credit or not. Do you, would you mind saying a word about that, and then I'll stop. Um, the the uh, in terms of just the in, what that enhanced. I'm sorry to surprise you with it because this is no. I'm sorry. Activity, I'm but what that extra money meant in terms of the child tax credit during COVID? Um, I, the extra child, child tax credit, I mean, it, me personally, in my own experience, allowed me to pay back rent. Um, so it, it was extremely helpful. It was, I'm, like I had said in my testimony, I mean, I'm like, it's not an unfamiliar story that it, it had helped just take a huge weight off of my shoulders. That's what... That's what families say to me, is that it, the stress, the stress, the stress is what it relieved. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And I apologize to my colleague for going over. Thank you, Senator. And especially thank to every one of you, the witnesses today that came in to so hear from you all today. So thank you. You know, you know, protecting SNAP and preventing fraud isn't a Republican or Mer Democratic issue, though. I think we both everyone agree on that. It's time for the USDA to, and state agencies updated their technology security to prevent fraud. I, hope we, I would hope we all agree. I intend to strengthen the USDA's tools to existing mandate to do so. The USDA is already making significant efforts to modernize SNAP and its nutritional assistance. One of these efforts are updating the Thrifty Food Plan, which, which we all have discussed today. This update is a modest investment with a significant impact for working Americans who need it. We have to work to protect SNAP for the 21st century, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to getting that done. I heard from one respondent's theme during this hearing that those who use SNAP do not want to use it forever. It is, I have never met any American that they hoping that they can stay on SNAP for their whole lives. Not at all, no one does. They only are on it because they need it. SNAP is a program that helps individuals like Ms. Hasty and the people like Mr. Excuse me, Mrs. Jones at Brown and Ms. Reynolds to work with. It all helps Americans who fall on hard times. And I'll end with this. We need to pass a farm bill that works for everyday Americans. The record will remain for a being for five more days. And now this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>